Hi everyone, um, I'm Marte Sos, I work at the Ethereum Foundation and I work on ETBM. Uh, that is a smart contract verification tool that I will be talking about today. Um, just in general, I'm going to try to follow this structure. So I'm just going to give a bit of an overview of what the ETBM is, um, how to actually use it, and in case you want to contribute uh, to the tool. And I'll try to contribute, or uh, I'll try to um, wrap it up at the end to you know, see how you can make use of this tool in your own workflows. So just a little bit of a recap. Uh, testing usually follows, is, is a discipline, and usually follows a, a, a testing strategy that you should have for your own tools. This, of course, is true for almost everything you build, but especially in a, in a space as, uh, let's say, risky as uh, building tools that potentially can have billions of, of euros, uh, you better have some form of testing strategy. And that testing strategy usually encompasses something within this is, uh, test, what's called the test triangle, which is usually, you know, starts from the very bottom with unit tests, like very small unit tests, all the way to the, almost to the top, where it's this user acceptance testing, which is almost like the end API testing that you would do. And then on top of that, typically you pay a pen testing company or yourself also do some kind of exploratory testing, right? So this is how a testing strategy could look like. There's, of course, other parts and bits and pieces. But anyway, that's a testing strategy that you could have, and many large organizations would normally have. Um, and uh, as part of these tests, usually you have different kinds of tests, like does it actually work at all? Like does the API like, <laughs> uh, work the, the way that I expect it to work? But you would normally also have something called negative tests and positive tests. And in the, for example, a negative test would be that you, um, you check against the system going into a known bad state, and a positive test would be that you check that the, um, the, uh, the, the system performs as expected and holds the invariance that you expect it to hold. So um, you can do this kind of testing, and uh, HEVM would try to help with some of this um, in the following way. So but the way HEVM works is that it has uh, a concrete semantic execution of EVM bytecode, that is to say that you can, you can handcraft your EVM bytecode and execute it. You can also take something off of the blockchain that you don't know the solid uh, code for it. You only know the EVM bytecode that actually gets executed. And you can take that and execute it concretely within HEVM, so just like get. Or you can execute it symbolically. And the way the symbolic execution works is that you it takes a... Um, uh, um, as some kind of uh, input as a known bad state or an invariant that you want to check against, um, examines all the execution paths that can be taken within this, within this execution, finds the set of requirements to satisfy or invalidate your invariants to satisfy the known bad uh, states, and then runs an external tool to try to figure out ways to satisfy these requirements, and eventually I prints to you a, a set of inputs that will trigger those uh, known bad states or invalidate your invariance that you want to have. So let me sh show you an example because I think that might be a bit easier. Um, here is, for example, uh, and I'm going to use Solidity because I guess that's kind of easier for people to read than EVM bytecode. So here is a simple Solidity code. Uh, obviously. Uh, what you do is you put into A something that is really large and it will overflow and therefore B will actually not be larger than A because it becomes zero, right? So this is a very classical thing. Of course, you, see, you can see the uncheck there because I want this to be unchecked. Otherwise, Solidity will actually put a check around this and this will never hold. So HVM in this case will trivially find the, uh, the, the, the case where A is all the FFF and uh, will actually output you a, a, a call, that is to say, it will tell you that you need to call this function uh, with A equals to this large number, and this will trigger the known bad state. So this is this known bad state that you want, don't, don't want to happen. So let's say that you would say, okay, well, that's quite easy because I can trigger that with a fuzzer. Like, I guess, do you know, does anybody, like, hands up if you know what a fuzzer is? Okay, so that's quite a lot of people. So the others who are not familiar with the fuzzer, the fuzzer what it does is that it puts in 
basically random values into the, um, in this case, the function parameters, so a and b, for example, and tries to put in a lot of different random numbers and see if it can trigger any of the assert false fails that are in this case right there. Now, the problem with something like that is that you would have to like try a lot of different numbers to figure out that those two numbers actually trigger the fault. And so this is kind of like trying to find a, a needle in a haystack. If your program can be, can be forced to fail quite easily or can be easily faulted with like special numbers that are known, for example, the zero FFFFF is a very, zero X FFFFF is a very well known sort of problematic number, um, then you will have a trouble trying to find these kind of faults. Whereas single execution will immediately find this, this problem no, no, within, within a second. And you can run this on a fuzzer, and I'm pretty sure none of the fuzzers will actually figure this thing out. Um, of course, I could use much more complicated uh, mathematics here, and HVM will just do the trick anyway. So this is kind of the difference between single execution and fuzzing. There's more to it, of course. But the bottom line is that the, um, the, the uh, symbolic execution will be sort of slow and smart, whereas the fuzzing will be fast and kind of dumb. It will run the concrete semantics. It's quite easy to do. You can just run get if you really wanted to. And it will uh, run it really, really fast and try it with many different values. And then hopefully it triggers the fault and now you discover that there's a problem. But if it doesn't, then you are stuck because it will never prove to you that there is no such input, whereas HUVM will actually compute that there is no such input, or if there is, it will actually give you a counterexample, that is to say, a way to call this function. Um, right. So now that was the known bug, and then how to do invariants. So an invariant in your code is, for example, you want to make sure that the total balance of all your tokens is x. And you assume, you basically put this required at the beginning of each of your functions, for example, in this case, you put a require there and say, well, I require that the invariant holds at the beginning of this function, let's say a transfer function, and you require that the, the invariant holds at the end as well. But instead of require, you put an assert. So now, in case at the end of your function your invariant doesn't hold, then this tool can actually find a way to execute your, your function such that the invariant holds at the beginning but doesn't hold at the end. So something went wrong within your, within your system, right? And this can be very helpful in case you know your invariance. Of course, you need to write your invariance. This thing doesn't know what is your invariance. It doesn't understand that, for example, maybe your invariance is not that all tokens must, that the total sum of all tokens must be uh, the same fixed value, but instead it must be total, like always decreasing. So now you have to describe that as an invariant instead of, you know, it needs to be a fixed value. Right. Um, the other thing that the uh, HVM can also do, which is quite nice, is that sometimes you will see that people write custom EVM bytecode just because they want to make sure that their gas costs are as low as possible. Or maybe other reasons, one of them would be that you want to minimize your gas costs. And what that means is that sometimes there's a very simple function that you could use, which is on the left, but it uses a lot of gas. And there is one that you came up with which seems to use a lot less gas and thus seems to do the same exact thing. Now, HVM can actually validate that it does exactly the same thing. So the tool will behave in all potential cases the same way. So this is called the equivalence checking. And it can give you assurance that your handwritten you know, master code that you wrote on the right is actually the same as the thing that you can actually review and understand better on the left. right? So this can help you gain assurance, right? So all testing is basically just trying to gain assurance that the system does what you expect it to do. It's up to you to define what the expectation is, of course. But uh, HVM can help you do that. So there are some, as with every other tool, HVM has its own set of limitations. One of them can be that, for example, loop can be, loops can be challenging. So if you have a loop in your code, then remember that this is symbolic execution, which means that it tries to do every single potential branch. It doesn't just try one branch, as the concrete execution will do. Right? The concrete execution substitutes the concrete values that it guesses, runs it, and says, well, it didn't seem to have done anything wrong. Let's try another concrete value. In this case, that's not, that's not what we're doing. right? What we're doing is that we try every single potential way of executing the system. And if there's an infinite loop, then it will, we will actually loop infinitely. 
um, which means that we'll never terminate, which means quite bad. So instead, what we do is that we actually limit ourselves to a number of loop iterations, and we'll warn the user that this is all we could do because we can't run infinitely. Um, and so that loops can be challenging. We actually have an option for that, but still, it can, especially loops within loops, etc., etc. Um, recursion, which is just another way of doing loops, basically, can be a bit of a problem, especially if you call yourself, right? That's basically just another loop. Um, complicated mathematical uh, uh, expressions can be a challenge, uh, because in complete execution, if it's just an exponentiation, it's an exponentiation, you can actually sometimes use the, uh, the built-in assembly instructions into the CPU to do it quite fast. In our case, we actually have to symbolically describe the, uh, the exponentiation, which can be quite complicated. Um, and um, you could, um, we, in, while in concrete case, in concrete execution, it doesn't quite help, for example, that you could require at the beginning of all your functions describing the known things that, are, that you know are correct right now about the program. But for us, if you actually describe those things, then we can limit the number of branches that we need to go through, right? So if you know some kind of an invariant always holds at the beginning of the program, and you add that as a require, then we will actually run faster because we don't have to run those, those branches. So we can prune branches away, which is it's not really a limitation, but it's something to look out for when you're writing your code. And finally, HVM itself is not verified code. So while it does some verification and uses some tools that do verification, it, the, the transformation that we do and the interpretations that we do of your bytecode is not actually verified. So there could be a bug in HVM, and we could potentially say that you know, we have found no bug in your code, but actually we made the mistake. So that's always a possibility. So let's, let's just talk a little bit about how the system actually works. Um, so, right. So the way this actually works is that we um, we we do an interpretation of the bytecode, a line by line interpretation, just like you would do with a concrete execution system. Except that instead of describing a single execution through this uh, set of instructions, we describe a mathematical equation. For every single, like we, we build up a mathematical equation that step by step gets, of course, larger and larger as we keep on interpreting. And in case there is a branch, like a jump instruction, a, a conditional jump instruction, then we branch. We actually start, we do two, right? So we start writing, um, effectively, the, the, the equation gets doubled and we, we execute both branches and then make a gigantic global um, equation at the end, uh, well, expression, let's put it that way, not an equation. And that gigantic um, expression at the end will need to be uh, checked for all their potential final states, whether any of them validates the, um, the, um, the invariance or triggers any of the um, bad states that you were uh, interested in checking for. So for example, here's a relatively simple function, uh, the one that we have seen before, where we're trying to uh, see if I can add one to a value and make it smaller than the initial value, right? And there is indeed one like this, the zero x of that uh, value. And um, in this particular case, the, um, the final, uh, the final uh, expression that will come out for us is this one at the bottom, which basically just says, if I add to variable a one, then it will be less than or equal to variable a. Right? So it's relatively easily readable. This is effectively a mathematical equation if you think about it just from high school. And um, most, uh, I mean, in this particular case, we know that this is within a modular arithmetic, and so this will be possible. Of course, this will not be possible in the, in the case of infinite integers, but this is not infinite integers. This is the EBM, so we have 256-bit semantics, and this will roll around. And what we do is once we have created this expression, as you see at the bottom, is it will now translate this to something called an SM, uh, SMP length. An SMP is a, a set, set of those theories. And in this particular case, we use the, uh, the theory of bit vectors, which means that um, we uh, use an external tool, for example, Z3, if you have ever heard of this uh, tool, um, to uh, try to solve this equation. So basically, we have the equation that you see at the top, 
And we don't try to solve this equation. Instead, we give this to an external tool and ask this external tool, is there a solution to this equation? And the external tool actually gives the answer at the bottom. As you can see, it's exactly the counterexample that we were looking for. And now we'll parse this uh, counterexample uh, for the user and give the, the, the offending a call as, a, as an output so that you can actually um, test it yourself. Like you can, you can write the test case and show someone that, hey, you know, there is actually a bug in this, in this system, either because in this case you enter the wrong, a known wrong state or because you can invalidate the invariant you know, the invariant held at the beginning of the function and known the goals at the end of the function. So therefore, uh, there's a way to, to invalidate your assumptions about, about the system. So this is kind of just to understand how HEM works, like more like the internal and how it could be used from the perspective of, um, of uh, a fuzzing strategy, uh, sorry, a testing strategy and within that, uh, this is basically a form, it's not really a fuzzer, it's a prover, but normally it would be used in conjunction with a fuzzer. And now I just want to show you how to do this like actually by hand. So how do you actually do this? Well, uh, you can um, you can get, you can use Foundry. I guess you know what Foundry is. Uh, many people use it for uh, for for uh, building and 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 and, and, and uh, well creating um, project on projects on top of uh, Ethereum, then there is uh, of course HVM itself, and you will also need a version of Z3 in this case. And basically, you add this uh, function with a prove underscore in front of it, and then force build an HVM test. And that's it. It will force build will of course build all your all your files, all your solidity files, and each EVM test will find these uh, JSON files, parse them all up, check where any of them has a proof in front of it, and then try to find a way to uh, to to find a counter example, basically to, to trigger this assertion failure. And we also have a, a repository for benchmarks where uh, in case you have found something that, you know, for example, HVM struggled with, or HVM had some bugs, um, or if you have found that another tool, in this case, Halmosh, did perform better than HVM, then you can contribute back to us um, to, uh, so that we can actually improve uh, the performance of, it, of, of HVM for the particular cases that you have found that it wasn't doing very well. Um, this benchmark repository is actually maintained not only by us, but also by the Halmosh team. So that's another tool that you can try to use that has a very similar interface uh, for, for uh, users. And finally, in case you have found uh, HEVM to be maybe not as good as you would have liked it to be, although I really hope that it will be as good as you would have liked it to be, I think it's actually very exciting uh, as, a, as a tool uh, on its own. But of course, nothing is perfect. Then here you'll find um, ways to contribute. Um, maybe I just want to show you at the very bottom, like what are the kind of things that is possible to do in case you want to improve the performance of HVM. It's not as complicated as it seems. For example, this is nothing but a, a rewrite tool. So it will say that if you add zero to a number, then of course it will be the original number. So in this case, we're adding A and B. And if B is zero, then it's just A, and if A is zero, then it's just B, and otherwise it's A, a plus B. These kind of rules are sound quite simple, but they, they help simplify the equation, the, the equation down, the expression down that we, uh, that we talked about, and then can significantly improve the performance of the tool. So these kind of relatively simple, so I guess most people would see this to be quite of elementary mathematics, and these kind of elementary mathematical rules can actually improve the performance of the tool, so if you have ideas, uh, they're very much welcome. Okay, I'm gonna try to wrap up, probably I'm quite quick. Um, so, I, I mean, as a, as a conclusion, I think I, I just wanna um, say that HEVM, of course, is not a standalone tool that now you have run your, your problem, like your, 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 um, your uh, contract through HEVM, and now, finally, it is completely, completely secure. That's not how it works. HEVM is part of your fantastic strategy, so there should be a lot of unit tests and and, and, and integration tests and, 
end user tests and uh, exploratory testing, and then as part some uh, as part of some of that, there should be some fast testing, and as part of that, there should be some um, proving that some of those fast tests can actually not be triggered neither by fuzzing nor by uh, symbolic execution. And so, therefore, HEVM should be a tool that can help basically give you more confidence in the correctness of your um, of your system. One thing that I think is quite interesting with an HEVM is that because it forces your hand to both think of the kind of invariants you would like to have and to think about all the bad states that you want the, don't want the system to end up in, it should help you think more from a higher level about the kind of things that your system should be doing and should not be doing, rather than individual function calls and individual overflows, etc. So if you think of HVM as this kind of tool that can help you uh, create a higher level understanding of what your, your contract or your, your system should be doing, then it has already helped. Um, hopefully it can do more, but that's maybe a change of perspective that it can sort of force uh, people to have. I think that's all for the moment, but you have probably questions. Thank you for the presentation, super interesting. And I have a question. Uh, I mean, you mentioned that you are able to build like equation from the code, right? So these are linear or non-linear equation? Good question. So um, it depends on what's inside your uh, code. So in case your code, for example, I mean, this code here, uh, this code here, this prove add, will only have uh, linear arithmetic in there, right? Because it only has an, a, an, an addition, a module addition in here. But in case your tool has a multiply, multiplication in it or exponentiation in it, then we're talking about nonlinear arithmetic and that will be quite complicated. Um, yeah. So it will become quite complicated. Of course, it's still modulo whatever and in paper it's all doable. But um, practically speaking, it gets much harder and you will see these kind of tools uh, struggle quite a bit. It also depends on the type of uh, solver you use eventually because we support many different solvers to run your, your problem on. I'm just trying to find, so here this SMP expression that I show in the middle, this can be parsed up by up to five different tools that comes off the top of my head and they will happily try to solve it. So some of them will perform better and others will perform worse. But um, it mostly depends on the kind of code you're writing. I mean, if the code is mostly about um, logic, like branching logic of like how, you know, if this happens, if that happens, then that's, there's no, you know, there's not even arithmetic in there, right? It's just an if and else. But if your code suddenly becomes something quite complicated, like some economic incentive that you know we're gonna give 0 0.05 percent of this to that and that percent is a multiplication right so now we're in trouble yeah okay now the question it's also not this other question the question is i mean if you have this linear system of equation that is describing your code are you able to like investigate this the, um, the state matrix so for example trying to find out to eigen value eigen vectors to try to explore the property of the code like exploring linear algebra uh, basic uh, features so i mean how in, in the physics you build uh, equations to describe a system right and then you analyze the state matrix to investigate the property of the system in this case if you are able to build a system of linear equations describing the code is it possible or makes no sense? No, so what we actually do is that we describe for each end state, okay, so the you know, program starts and terminates, right? I think if it doesn't terminate, I think we can just forget about it for the moment because we're going to run out of gas at one point. So, you know, it terminates at one point, so it has an end and a beginning. So this beginning and end is one, is one of these pairs that will end up. And this describes completely what happens within this execution trace, right? And so then we can ask queries whether this you know, execution state validates one of your invariants. Well, it invalidates one of your invariants. 
So we only ask that. Now there could be other questions asked. For example, <clears throat> can you compute an invariant that holds for every single uh, execution? Right? That would be another question to be asked. Um, but we don't do that. But that would be an interesting problem. But I would say that's more like more towards research. I mean, this is also quite researchy, but that's even more like sort of even more uncharted territory. But it would be interesting to see if you can basically you you give me your contract and I tell you these are the invariants that hold about your contract. That would be maybe interesting because then you know the programmer could say, okay, well this invariant I want and I didn't expect that invariant. And then you can try to, you know, that they, they might find some issues with that. Um, you can also flip this around, of course, and say, okay, how are, what are the different kinds of ways you can uh, execute your program? And given these, uh, this symbolic interpretation, you could potentially create a set of test suits out of nowhere that actually runs all the different ways you can execute this thing. So I tell you, I give you a, a, a test suit given the code, which is quite powerful if you think about it. Uh, but we don't do that either. It's interesting, and maybe one day, I guess, but it's not the goal right now. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, can you talk a bit about, I mean, it's probably difficult, but can you talk a bit about the, the limitations of JVM? So how, how large what is the size of a contract system you can analyze? What is the, I mean, yeah, of course, it, it depends on whether it's linear or not, I guess, but I don't know, can you give some examples? That's actually a good question. Um, we do actually have um, a bunch of interesting examples um, that we have collected as part of um, uh, these kind of like coding challenges and uh, tricky, like capture the flag, uh, programs that that tend to be kind of tricky but small um, that we can definitely work with and the underlying idea has been used on things like Uniswap so it's not like something completely unheard of although it wasn't HEDM at the time that was used to verify parts of Uniswap but um, in theory, it's capable of verifying large systems such as Uniswap. As far as I'm concerned, I think it should be capable of doing that, but it might need some help. So you might need to simplify some parts of your, of your, of your program such that this actually terminates. Um, but we are actually, probably should do a bit more on, on um, applying this to real world examples. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something that we probably should do a bit more of, but it's definitely possible to do it, and the underlying idea has been used in, in very fine large systems. But this particular implementation, yeah, it might struggle with something, it might do way better than you expect. I think if it's, if it's logic of the system that you're trying to verify, then it will do extremely well, because the logic is just, it's just branching left and right. If you're trying to start verifying some complicated mathematics, uh, some incentive, then you're, you, you, the, the, there could be issues where, where non-linearity will just blow up the problem into something that will never get, like never terminate. But I think some of that can be escaped by saying, well, you know, I'm really interested in the logic of the program and not so interested in the 0 0.05 or whatever multiplication that is in this, in this, in this line of code. And you sort of simplify that away, and then you might, then HVM hopefully should be able to, uh, to, to verify the correctness, at least of the, what's called normally in the banking space, this would be called the business logic, right? The, 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 the way the system should be executing in terms of, of the, the branching, not in terms of the actual values that come out of it. I don't know if I answered the question, but. Uh, yes, I think there's one in the back, maybe. Uh, so, I think in languages like Haskell, uh, the property based testing is popular. Is it, is it fair to say that this HGVM is uh, like, you know, adding a form of property based testing to the yeah, to, to languages? Could you maybe like, 
Um, yes, that is that is that is very very fair to say. Yes, correct, indeed. But this actually so property based testing is a form of fuzzing, right? So you have this kind of property and it fuzzes that for that property. And if you can invalidate that property with one particle execution out of two to the power of a thousand, it, it will likely not find it. Whereas this will actually find it. Either it doesn't terminate or it finds it. So those are the two options. So the, in that sense, it's stronger than the standard property-based testing, if I understand correctly. So within that space, this would be more stronger, but it's also weaker in the sense that it might not terminate. Whereas the you know the property-based testing, what it does is that it substitutes concrete you know concrete values into into um, into the into values that, that you expect you ask it to substitute into, and then executes the concrete semantics. So it will always terminate. It will just not find necessarily all the counterexamples, right? Yeah, and, and, and that's and the stronger property is because you, you're, you're using an SMT solver, I think, yes, right? Right, exactly, yes. I mean, you validate the property using the SMT solver, but the thing is that the property itself needs to be you know, described in, a, in, in an expression which, is, which requires an interpretation of the semantics into a symbolic uh, expression, and then that symbolic expression needs to be somehow eventually described into this SMP which you mentioned. So this, this kind of these two steps are the key steps, but I mean, they all also themselves break down into sub-steps, for example, simplification of the expression, filtering of the expression, etc., etc. So there are some interesting like in-betweens, but that's correct. 